OpenStreetMap is the Wikipedia of maps, and so it's, so it's a map that citizens contribute to. So it's a map that appears on the website, openstreetmap.org, but then you can edit it. What OpenStreetMap really is, is a citizen-generated database of geographical information. This is very different to the way Google organizes itself. They, they have a set of map products. Google's business is, is more about you know, places where there's you know, commercially valuable information, where there's revenue to be had. They never publish the raw data that makes up the map, the, the, the coordinates of the streets, for example. All of that data is kept locked away in Google's case, um, because that's really their, their commercial advantage. Organizations like the Ordnance Survey here in the UK, they have uh, always had raw map data which they will license to other organizations at great cost. And so OpenStreetMap was formed here in the UK actually out of, out of frustration. And I think it was a surprise to the people that started the project that actually there were a lot of people out there that, were, that really wanted open licensed map data so badly that they were willing to do this crazy thing of going out in the streets with a GPS unit and trying to build a map from scratch. We were trying to empty our minds of other maps because we didn't want to be accused of copying. We were trying to create a brand new map which was open licensed, but we're going to fill in the streets and gather the street names and all of that very basic data. And then uh, over, over time here in London, we've seen all of the streets mapped out in a lot of detail, but that's just London, of course. And we, we've seen the coverage of the map um, spreading, but you get these wonderful blossoms of detail appearing just, just when one person gets interested in it. Unfortunately, we do have an uneven level of coverage. So this is one of the challenges of working with OpenStreetMap data. Um, like, there's no guarantee that a particular level of detail has been reached everywhere. We, we are consumers of maps in order primarily to find out where our patients are and where, the, and where their greatest needs are. And if we find that an area of tremendous vulnerability and where there's you know, a lot of humanitarian and medical need and interest, that there isn't sufficient base mapping, well, there's nothing stopping us from contributing it. Well, the canonical example of real humanitarian open street map work was in Haiti after the earthquake when there was an incredible rash of volunteer mapping that happened and it created a, an extraordinarily detailed map of the capital area, Port-au-Prince. Everyone was sitting at home watching the news, watching the disastrous earthquake in Haiti and, uh, and then I think a lot of the open street map community sort of naturally felt curious to see how much data we had, how, how was the map looking in Haiti? The answer was it was looking very bare. We had a, a few roads in place. Um, and so we were, we were thinking, well, maybe we should try and boost the coverage of, of these cities where this disaster was struck. Um, people just started contributing to the map in that area. This was a process of remote mapping, so looking at the aerial imagery that we had available to us. When we had our patients come into the cholera centers and they tell us where they're from, because of the open street map work that had been done, we were able to actually correlate those neighborhoods that they gave us as their origins to actual places and figure out where more patients were coming from and where, for example, there were water outages, which we were then able to help correct. So in that sense, the map actually helped to save lives. The humanitarian open street map work has been done in the Haitian earthquake, the Ebola disaster that just happened, the Nepal earthquake, the Philippines typhoon. In all of these places, you know, increasingly as time goes on, it's the default map and it's happening with volunteers all over the world. But it's still very much also about on the ground surveys. So we're, we're encouraging the community to go out and look at the, the real world with their own eyes. And, uh, and that's how we can really create a unique, uh, valuable data set that really has a sense of ownership with the community living in a local area. So increasingly, we're starting to encourage our field teams to collect that geographical data about their activities and put it on OpenStreetMap. We generally ask permission, you know, do you mind if we put your village on the map? And, and, and invariably what the people say is, yes, we'd like to be on the map. We'd like for people to know that we exist. Every month we have a mapathon in London which attracts 75 to 100 people and they sit down and they trace some area. I mean, last month we were doing Chad. And we bring 100 people and some pizzas and maybe a few bottles of beer or wine and everyone sits down and looks at the satellite imagery and traces the things that are necessary. We need you to trace the houses here. We need the road network there. We need the water courses but it's actually contributing meaningfully in real time to actual humanitarian operations. In a way, OpenStreetMap could be thought of as delivering real power to developers and empowering an ecosystem of different third parties doing really interesting stuff with OpenStreetMap data. And there's still lots of niches for people to organize that data. There are several companies that actually make quite a good living organizing and presenting the OpenStreetMap data. Um, 
very usefully. So I don't think having all this data out there in an open format is going to destroy business opportunities. Quite the contrary, I think it's going to create them.